Hey everyone, my name is Roger Abau and I'm going to present the nation building in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia consists of 11 countries that reach from Eastern India to China and is generally divided into mainland and island zones. The mainland is actually an extension of the Asian continent. Muslims can be found in all mainland countries but the most significant populations are in southern Thailand and western Burma. The Cham people of central Vietnam and Cambodia are also Muslim. The geography, environment, and cultural zones in Southeast Asia. Virtually all of the Southeast Asia lies between the tropics and so there are similarities in climate as well as plant and animal life throughout the region. Mainly sea and jungle products are unique to the region and were therefore much desired by international traders in early times. There are some differences in the physical environment of mainland and island Southeast Asia. Temperatures are generally warm, although it is cooler in highland areas. For example, several small islands in eastern Indonesia were once the world's only source of cloves, nutmeg, and maize. The entire region is affected by the monsoon winds which blow regularly from the northwest and then reverse to blow from the southeast. These wind systems are being fairly predictable rainy seasons, and before steamships were invented, this wind system also enabled traders from outside the region to arrive and leave at regular intervals. And because of this reliable wind pattern, Southeast Asia became a meeting place for trade between India and China the two great markets of early Asia. The first feature of mainland geography is the long rivers that begin in the highlands separating Southeast Asia from China and Northwest India. A second feature is the extensive lowland plains separated by forested hills and mountain range. The third feature of mainland Southeast Asia is the long coastline. Despite a strong agrarian base, the communities that develop in these regions were also part of the maritime trading network that link Southeast Asia to India and to China. These fertile plains are highly suited to rice growing ethnic groups such as the Thais. The Burmese and the Vietnamese who developed settled cultures that eventually provided the basis for modern states. The highlands were occupied by tribal groups who displayed other sense of identity through distinct, distinctive styles in clothing, jewelry, and hairstyles. The lifestyle, livelihood, and subsistence in Southeast Asia. A distinctive feature of Southeast Asia is its cultural diversity. Archaeological evidence dates human habitation of Southeast Asia to around a million years ago, but migration into the region also has a long, long history. Around 4,000 years ago, people speaking languages belonging to the Austronesian family began to trickle into island Southeast Asia. Of the 6,000 languages spoken in the world today, an estimated 1,000 are found in Southeast Asia. A remarkable feature of Southeast Asia is the different ways people have adapted to local environments in pre-modern times. M many nomadic groups lived permanently in small boats and were known as Orang Lao or Sea People. On the, fer on the fertile plants of Java and mainland Southeast Asia, sedentary communities grew irrigated rice along the coasts, which were less suitable for the agriculture because of mangrove swamps, fishing, and trade were the principal occupations. Cultural changes began to affect Southeast Asia around 2,000 years ago with influence coming from two directions. The arrival of Islam in Southeast Asia Islamic teachings began to spread in Southeast Asia from around the 13th century. Islam teaches the oneness of God who has revealed his message through a succession of prophets and finally through Muhammad. There are no priests in Islam but there are many learned teachers known as ulama who interpret Islamic teachings according to the writings and commentaries of scholars in the past. And the teachings of the four schools of law practiced within the majority Sunni tradition 
The basic teachings of Islam are contained in Quran, the revelation of Allah's will to Muhammad, and in the Hadith reports of Muhammad's statement or deeds. There are several specific requirements of a Muslim which are known as the five pillars. And after the Prophet's death, Islam continued to expand at the height of its power between the 8th and 15th centuries. Islam was subsequently brought to India by a similar moment of conquest and conversion, and its dominant political position was confirmed when the Mughal dynasty was established in the 16th century. The chronology of Islam's arrival in Southeast Asia is not known exactly. From at least the 10th century, Muslims were among the many foreigners trading in Southeast Asia, and a few individuals from Southeast Asia traveled to the Middle East for study. The first confirmed mention of a Muslim community came from Marco Polo, the well-known tra traveler who stopped in North Sumatra in, in 1292. A major development was the decision of the ruler of Malacca on the west coast of the Malay Peninsula to adopt Islam around 1430. The Arabic words were incorporated into Malay, particularly in regard to spiritual beliefs, social practices, and political life. The inscriptions and graves with Muslim dates have been located in other coastal areas along the trade routes. Malacca was a key tra trading center and the Malay language is spoken in the Malay Peninsula and East, and East Sumatra was used in a lingua franca in trading ports throughout the Malay Indonesian archipelago. Malay is not a difficult language to learn and it was already understood by many people along the trade routes that link the island world. Muslim teachers therefore had a common language through which they could communicate new concepts through oral presentations and written texts. Islam's success was primarily due to a process that historians term localization by which Islamic teachings were often adapted in ways that avoided major conflicts with existing attitudes and customs. Local heroes often became Islamic saints and their graves were venerated places at which to worship. Some aspects of mystical Islam resembled pre-Islamic beliefs, notably on Java. Cultural practices like cockfighting and gambling continued and spirit reputation remained central in the lives of most Muslims, despite Islam's condemnation of polytheism. Reforming tendencies gained strength in the early 19th century where, wherein a group of known as the Wahhabis captured Mecca. The changes that Islam introduced were often most visible in people's ordinary lives. Pork was forbidden to Muslims as a significant development in areas like Eastern Indonesia and the Southern Philippines, where it had long been ritual food. A Muslim could often be recognized by a different dress style, like chest covering for women, male circumcision, became an important rite of passage. Muslims in urban centers acquired more access to education, and Quranic schools became a significant focus of religious identity. The Wahhabis demanded a stricter observance of Islamic law. Although their appeal was limited in Southeast Asia, some people were attracted to Wahhabi styles of teaching. There was a growing feeling that greater observance of Islamic doctrine might help Muslims to resist the growing power of Europeans. Muslim leaders were often prominent in anti-colonial movements, especially in Indonesia. However, the influence of modernist Islamic thinking that developed in Egypt meant educated Muslims in Southeast Asia also began to think about reforming Islam as a way of answering the Western challenge. These reform-minded Muslims were often impatient with rural communities or traditionalists who maintained older pre-Islamic customs. Europeans eventually colonized all Southeast Asia except for Thailand. Malaya, Burma, Singapore, and Western Borneo were under the British. The Dutch claimed the Indonesian archipelago, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam were French colonies. Estimor belonged to Portugal, and the Spanish and the later the Americans controlled the Philippines. After these countries gained their independence following World War II, 
the major question for politically active Muslims has concerned the relationship between Islam and the state. In countries where Muslims are in the minority, this relationship is still causing tension. In Malaysia, Muslims are only around 55% of the population and there must be significant adjustments with the largest non-Muslim group, the Chinese. In Indonesia, Muslims are engaged in a continuing debate about different ways of observing the faith and whether Islam should assume a greater role in government. History Southeast Asia became the scene of battles between Allied and Japanese forces during the World War II. Since the war of the countries of Southeast Asia have re-emerged as independent nations, they have been plagued by political turmoil weak economies, ethnic strife, and social inequalities. Although the situation for most Southeast Asian nations improved in the 1980s and 1990s due to the influence of the Americans. Throughout the 1960s and early 1970s, however, there were open conflicts between the communist and non-communist factions, especially in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In 1967, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand created the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or what we call today as the ASEAN. Since then, Brunei, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia have joined ASEAN. In 1997, a monetary collapse in Thailand sparked a general economic crisis in several nations in the region. The results were the most severe in Indonesia, which under economic, political, and social turmoil in the late 1990s. Religions, ethnicity, and language were diverse throughout Southeast Asia. There are dozens of religions including Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, and Roman Catholicism. The people in Southeast Asia Southeast Asia is the one of the world's great melting pots. Its diverse peoples move into the region in search of a better life and greater security. More than three quarters of Southeast Asia population is agricultural based. Much fish is consumed in this region, reflecting the long coastlines and river environments of Southeast Asia. The staple food throughout the region is rice, which has been cultivated for thousands of years. In Asia, there are different styles of eating food. In India and the Middle East as well as the Southeast Asia people typically eat with their hands. It is a very direct way to experience the texture of the food and the people wash their hands before and after each meal. Using of chopsticks Chopsticks are the utensils of choice and food is served onto individual plates or into individual bowls. But they, with the influence of Western cultures, is found not only in the use of, of tables and chairs in many modern Southeast Asian households, but also in the use of spoons and forks. That is all. Thank you. So good day everyone, my name is Laura Mia P. Igaran and today I will be discussing about the nation building of Thailand. Now to start with, let us have a little bit of history and background of Thailand. So the Kingdom of Thailand is one of the few developing countries never to have been colonized. So it, it, was, it is located centrally in Southeast Asia with both extensive Pacific coasts which are the Gulf of Thailand and Indian Ocean. So it has a population of 61,230,874, which was estimated in July 2020, making it the 16th largest country in the world. Though not as culturally diverse as other Southeast Asian countries such as Myanmar, Laos, or Indonesia, Thailand has nevertheless considerable ethnic diversity. Um, it contains more than 30 ethnic groups varying in history, language, religion, appearance, and also the patterns of livelihood. So the three major groups are the very first one, the ethnic Thais, roughly 45%. Next is the Thai of Laosan, located at North East, 
northeast of Thailand um, have 30% and lastly is the Sinothai, roughly 45% of the population. So from the 9th to 11th century, the central and western area of Thailand was occupied by Mon civilization called Devaravati. So the Mon share the same common lineage as the Khmers and settled in southern Burma. By the 11th to 12th centuries, Mon influenced over central Thailand. And the Khmers, on the other hand, were Southeast Asia's equivalent to Roman Empire. Um, they established in the 9th century the Khmer Kingdom, built its capital in Angkor, which is now the Cambodia, and expanded westward across the present-day central and northeastern Thailand. So we can really say that the Mon and Khmer civilizations really gave great um, influence towards the Thai civilization and they got even there even before even before the arrival of some Thai people. Now starting around the 10th century, the Thai people considered to be the ancestors of the contemporary Thais. They began migrating from southern China into present-day Southeast Asia. Um, large numbers of Thais fled present-day Burma and China to escape the Mongol armies of Kublai Khan. Several principalities in the Central Plains united and wrested control from the dying Khmer Empire and overthrew it, setting up Sokothai, which also means rising of happiness as their own kingdom in 13th century. They considered Sokothai as the first true Thai kingdom, marking their emergence as a distinct nation. But for a short period, from 1448 to 1486, the Sokothai capital was moved to Pitsanalo, but by that time, another star was rising in Thailand, which was the kingdom of Ayutthaya. So in the mid-14th century, the Ayutthaya kingdom began to dominate the main Namchao Basin during the twilight of Khmer period. So it survived the, for 416 years, defining itself as Siam's most important kingdom. Yet the glories of Ayutthaya were interrupted by the expansionist Burmese. So these Burmese troops had managed to lay siege to the capital for a year before destroying it in 1767. I mean. So the city was deeply devastated and its building and people were wiped out. Now with Ayutthaya in ruins, the line of succession of the king was broken and chaos ensued. So a former general, Taksin, also known as King Taksin the Great, claimed his right to rule, defeated potential rivals, and established his new capital in Thonbori, a settlement downriver from Ayutthaya with better access to trade. But after 15 years, the king was disposed to military. Um, so eventually, Chao Phraya Chakre assumed the throne as King Yotpa, also known as Ramawan, and established the Chakri dynasty, which still rules today. So the new monarch moved the capital across main Nam Chao Phraya to modern-day modern day Bangkok. So the first century of Bangkok, Bangkok rule um, focused on rebuilding the cultural, political, and military might of Ayutthaya. Now, in 1932, a group of young military officers and bureaucrats calling themselves as Kanaratsadun, which also means People's Party, were deeply dissatisfied with the tight political control of Siam's ruling families held over the country. So they mounted a successful but bloodless coup which marked the end of absolute monarchy and introduced a constitutional monarchy. So the leaders of the group were inspired by the democratic ideology they had encountered during the stu their studies in Europe. So these leaders were Pridi Phanomyong, a young lawyer studying in Paris, and Luang Fibung Sungkram, who was then studying military science in France. 
Moreover, the most important architect in the nation building undertaken by the post-1932 leadership was Luang Wichit Wathakan. He had worked his way up to the bureaucratic ladder by putting his many talents in the service of several Thai government. So he made his own contribution to the Thai public sphere through his historical and biographical writings, his plays, and also his essays on personal and national self-making. So Luang recognized instinctively that Siam's monarchy, which had been gently pushed aside but not sent into exile, as was a conduit to Siam's ancient past, and needed to be recognized and exploited for its nation-building potential. So in December 1938, Fibong Sumkram took over as military dictator. And the following year, he changed the name of the country from Siam to Thailand. So the change was part of his determination to bring his people into the modern world and at the same time to emphasize their unique identity. It was an anti-Chinese move with the slogan, Thailand for the Thai. So there were many Chinese in the country during that time and many prosperous Chinese businesses. But he cut down immigration from China and government-backed Thai businesses were set up. So while the use of Mandarin in Chinese schools was also limited to two hours a week. And then Thailand adopted the Western calendar, a new flag was created and a new national anthem. While he demanded also the Thai to wear Western Thai clothes. So, during 1957, Fibol's successor, which was General Saritharanet, subjected the country to a true military dictatorship. He abolished the constitution, dissolving the parliament, and banning all political parties. Um, furthermore, the one you can see in the picture are half a million people protesting around the Democracy Monument on October 14, 1973. So the economic development during the years of military dictatorship um, in the 1950s and 60s took place in the context of a world economic and localized economic boom created by the Korean and Vietnam Wars. However, this economic growth had profound impact on the nature of Thai society. Naturally, the size of the working class increased as factories and businesses were developed. Yet, under the dictatorship trade union, rights were suppressed and wages and conditions of employment were tightly controlled. So this resulted in the overthrow of the military dictatorship. Finally, Thai political and social thought today is still coming to terms with the nation-building project launched by the post-1932 elite. So the writings of Luang Wichitwatakan specifically his political theory as well as essays on personal and social development, continue to have a place in contemporary Thai consciousness. So from the mid-1980s until the financial crisis in 1997, the economic boom in Thailand opened the northern mainland to Thai business and encouraged travel and tourism in the region and reawakened interest in Thai peoples living in Myanmar, China, and even Laos. So that would be all. Thank you for listening. I hope you have learned something from me. Um, God bless and stay safe. Philippine archipelago with over 7,000 islands of which 2,000 were inhabited is considered as the world's largest island nation without land borders. It is located in Southeast Asia with the Philippines Sea in the north, South China Sea in the west, and Sulu and Celebes Sea in the south. Its nearest neighbor is the island of Borneo divided among three Southeast Asian countries, which is just 40 kilometers away from the southern Philippines. The 
this major island is Luzon, where the capital city, Manila, is located at to say half of the population. The two other islands were Visayas and Mindanao. All in all, there are 17 regions, and among these is the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Moscow and Mindanao, an independent region in the south. With such geographically and culturally diverse country, we hope to know how did these people get the idea of coming together? How did the people of the Philippines become a nation of Filipinos? To explain this nature, we have the shared collective trauma. It suggests that the experience of collective trauma is what binds the political communities together. So it is something that the society experiences collectively. It's like a core cultural um, memory, which is a uniting factor for us as a political unit. And also, for the Philippine context, it is colonialism, which is our collective trauma, because almost the entire Philippines have experienced it. And yes, we relate to it, that's why. Um, the spirit of nationalism was born out of this um, collective trauma. So, nation building is a very broad process in which the nation comes into being, and its very aim is the unification of the people. As for the Philippines, the nation building process was started even before independence during the colonial period, the colonial era, and till now, wherein we embraced the um, Western concept of um, nation states. However, there are so many challenges that we are facing today, not just the decolonization process before, but also the issue about multiculture, multilingual, and multinationality. Nation building is inseparable from the idea of nationalism because it's quite reasonable that only when a political or cultural community could um, have this sense or idea of nationalism that they could um, go on at the process of nation building as a community in a certain boundary or area. As a theoretical basis, we use the theory about the three phases of nationalism, namely the period of scholarly interest, the period of patriotic agitation, and the rise of mass national movement. For the period of scholarly interest, we could highlight the life of Rizal as an example. So he left the country in 1880 to study abroad in Spain, Berlin, and sort of the countries in Europe. And he was able to have this idea from Locke and Rousseau, the idea of nationalism. And there he was um, considered as one of the nation builders, the primary nation builders that um, have this idea that we are people, Filipino people, who are condensed in a single area. And there is no reason that we could not build our own nation because there are some other colonies in Europe before who were able to build their own state, build their own nation. Yes, and that is the reason why Rizal just um, advanced for integration. Yes, integration is his first motive, not independence. But later on, he was able to meet some radical people and there he convinced his own self that there really is a need for independence. All right, so let me quote this line from his famous novel, Anuri Mubis, The No Limit Tangera. So, the people did not complain because they have no voice. They do not move because they are lethargic. And you say, they do not suffer because you don't see their hearts bleed. So, it's poetic. 
Alright, so in his novels where he put his ideas, all of his ideas, would have this vivid image of what does the Philippines look like during the colonial period. So there we understand what exactly it feels like to be a nation, right? So Rizal uses the pronoun they. They because he believes that those experiences are not just um, experienced by one person, it is experienced by many. And that is the reason for a nation building. A nation could be built because people in any in area, any community, experiences the same feeling, experiences the same thing. And there is that um, connection between them, there is that link, that the experience links them together. They establish a connection is being out of those experiences, the collective experiences of the people. And this would lead people to know that as a nation, they could build their own state, they could decide for themselves, and they could, you know, get away of those intruders. The second phase is action-based, and independence was a great leap for the integration of our nation. Emilio Aguinaldo was able to unite leaders from parts of the Philippines, especially the North, and he asked for help from Admiral um, George Dewey, the U.S. Navy commander, so that they could um, supply weapons for the Katipuneros and bring them back here in the Philippines and also to take control of Manila. So with the help of the U.S., um, they are able to establish a revolutionary provisional um, government. Second phase, it is the time frame where we crave for our independence because we already recognize ourselves as a nation. So if the first phase was establishing still the idea that we are a nation, that we are people who are um, having this connection, having this link, for the second phase, um, it is acting upon that idea. It is um, involving, involving actions for that idea. So we could highlight the revolution for our independence during this time because we know it for ourselves that we could only build our own nation if there are no um, interfering power from others. There are no um, sort of people who or group of people who would control us. It would be ourselves alone. Ronaldo believes that independence is what we need to move forward. It is our tool towards the actualization of our nation-building process. This is how he asserts ourselves as a nation. Independence has become another set of experience that we have shared. The early Filipinos have acted upon and it's a thing for us to reminisce, a history for us to look back and it's a proof that we could unite together, our people could gather together and go for the goal that we always wanted. Third phase has started in the American imperial period where education has become more accessible. Many people have become literate and many people, many Filipinos have given the sense or the idea of nationalism and nation building. We have given the Americans the chance to colonize us even though they say that it's not their motive because they are just here to help us build our own nation, build our own state. And um, decades after, the Americans find it expensive to control our um, area, our country, because they are very far from us. And that's why the Commonwealth government was established and the Filipinos were the ones who administered it, but the Americans remained to be in power. So we trusted the Americans because we see ourselves in them. They are also a colony ones, and they are able to um, get out of that process, that colonization era, and build a nation out of themselves. The third phase continues, even today. The thought here is that 
we move as a nation, the whole nation, every single Filipino is able to participate in the process of nation building. There are policies that the government have established for us to be able to um, do our part in the nation building process. So the Philippines is all kinds of diverse, from biodiversity to people. We are geographically spread out, culturally different, and politically from region to region separated. So we are the people who have Malay ancestors, American accent, they cook Chinese food, and they love K-pop. Well, not for me. But that's the thing, the Philippines is really, really diverse, really, really different from people to people, and it's very difficult for these group of people to be united together as one nation, to feel that they belong together. Because, you know, differences can make us feel that the other person is alien from us. We have here two approaches that would define what is a nation and would help us identify what are our limits in nation building. So first, we have the modernist approach. It suggests that for a nation to be built, people must be defined by a common culture. They must share primarily a language with, along with the consciousness that they belong or they are having the same identity. For the ethno-symbolist perspective, we fail to articulate a national identity that could give a powerful and popular feeling which could be relevant to the lives of our people. The first problem that we could encounter here is our differences in terms of religion, because even though we are a Christian nation here in Asia, um, we cannot deny the presence of our Muslim brothers and sisters. During the colonization era, the Spanish efforts to colonize the southern Philippines sort of failed. So most of Mindanao has not been or has not been um, under the control of the Spanish colonizers. So, as of today, there is a great cleavage between the Christian and the Moro, or the Muslim. This has even um, provided um, negative stereotypes for our Muslim Filipinos. Moreover, some of our Muslim brothers and sisters only consider themselves as Filipino only by document, and this could be a great um, problem or a dilemma for our country because if some of our people do not really consider themselves to belong in the greater majority, it would be difficult for these people to be um, part of our nation building process. The second challenge we have classified under the ethno-symbolist approach is the marginalization of our indigenous brothers and sisters. So for years now, these indigenous people have been um, the less um, prioritized group of people, group of communities in our country, and they have felt that. There are also um, continuing issues for land ownership and, of course, discrimination. But today, there are efforts to include these people in the government sector and non-indigenous people have established advocacies to preserve the culture of these people, the first settlers considered first settlers of um, the Philippines. Everything, the nation building process of the Philippines have started even before its liberation and our shared collective trauma and experiences have played as the unifying factor for us, the people, to identify ourselves even with the 
people that we never met personally, we haven't talked to personally. And another is nationalism, which has played a big role in this whole process before until now. However, there are limits that nation building has been encountering, has been challenging the whole process. First is um, our unifying language, we lack that. Second is the diversity of the Philippines in terms of culture, in terms of ethnicity, and also religion. Efforts at building a homogeneous national identity in the Philippines over the centuries have resulted in an unusual patterns of successes and failures. But what is notable for Filipinos is the attitude to try again and do it better. As a nation, we have faced challenges from the outside side and the insides of our boundaries. However, these limits have not killed our willingness to be identified with each other and to establish our own adored Filipino nation. Hi everyone, my name is Grant Tagalawan and I'm going to discuss the writing the history of independent Indonesia and why did these multi-ethnic and multi-religious groups come together to form a country called the Republic of Indonesia? So Indonesia is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society. According to the 2010 population census, there are more than 145 ethnic groups in Indonesia, of which the largest is still the Japanese, and in terms of religion, Muslim has the majority. So first, we are going to trace back how the Dutch colonialism linked to the birth of modern Indonesia. Indonesian nationalists have argued that Indonesia today is a continuation of the great Buddhist Srivijaya Empire from 7th to 13th centuries and the Hindu Buddhist Majapahit Empire from 13th to 16th centuries. This is misleading because in fact, Indonesia is a modern construct. It was Dutch colonial rule that united various ethnic groups in Indonesian archipelago under one colonial administration and one economic and legal system. It was also under Dutch rule that the Dutch East Indies underwent major social change, including the emergence of modern Indonesian elite, which produced a nationalist movement. This nationalist movement emerged in the 20th century and was led by the Western educated indigenous Indonesian leaders whose aim was to eliminate Dutch rule and establish a modern Indonesian nation-state along with the colonial boundaries, not the earlier empire boundaries. So these leaders declared the country's independence on August 17, 1945, but the actual transfer of power from the Dutch to the Indonesians took place only in December 1949. Nevertheless, the nationalist movement, which can be seen as part of the nation-building process, had started prior to the World War II. All the Indonesian nationalist symbols were created during the nationalist movement. These are the national language, the national anthem, and the national flag. There are at least two types of nationalist movement. These are secular, which advocated Indonesian unity based on secular nation, unifying language, and unitary state. The second type is Islamic, which wanted to insert a clause in 1945 constitution requiring the Muslim to practice Sharia law, but it was eventually dropped in order to secure unity. Therefore, the concept of Indonesian nation was more secular than Islamic, even though Indonesia is approximately 88% Muslim. So the nation-building process in Indonesia has not been smooth. Ethnic and Islamic feelings have been strong, and the earlier period of the Republic, there were a number of rebellions, with some having strong ethnic characters and others are not. Earlier ethnic conflicts challenged to the Indonesian nation-state. So the form of Indonesia was at first federal, which would cater to different regional and ethnic interests. However, a few ethnic groups rebelled against the central government and sought to establish an independent state. So the first serious incident was in South Muluku, the homeland of the Christian Abunis. Many South Moluccans have family members in other parts of Indonesia, and the rebellion was identified with the Dutch. So in the eyes of the Indonesian nationalists, 
this was a Dutch plot rather than the genuine desire of the people. So after the rebellion, Indonesia became a unitary state which gave more power to the central government in Jakarta. So the second rebellion took place in Asi, a strongly Islamic area. The Asinis saw the Indonesian Republic as a Javanese and Minangkabau dominated state. However, the rebellion eventually failed. So the government employed soft and hard strategies. It restored the provincial status of Asi and appointed an Asinis as the governor. So using strong military operations and the divide and the rule policy among the Asinis, the rebellion was eventually crushed. So the third rebellion involved Aryan Jaya independence movement and was known as the Free Papua Movement. Unlike the two earlier separatist movements, the Free Papua Movement is recent and smaller in scale. National Integration and the Pancasela Ideology So the measures of national integration adopted by the Indonesian government since independence include the promotion of national language, national education, national symbols, national institutions, internal transmigration, and the national ideology or the Pan Casella. So the most obvious and successful are the promotion of an Indonesian national language and education. Indonesian national schools are required to use Bahasa Indonesia as a medium of instruction. And Indonesians of different ethnic groups are nationalized by learning the Indonesian language. So Indonesian national symbols such as national flag, the national anthem, and national emblem are generally accepted by the Indonesian population of various ethnic groups. So the presence of national institutions such as national armed forces instead of ethnic armed forces and national political parties instead of ethnic parties indicates the sense of national belonging in the country. So internal transmigration has not been very successful as it often created ethnic enclaves and ethnic conflicts. So the national ideology or the pan -casela. So these are the five principles of pan -casela. First, uh, belief in one almighty, humanism, Indonesian unity, democracy, and social justice. So belief in one almighty has, uh, was aimed at embracing all religious Indonesians. However, it also denies a special possession for Islam, reflecting a secular vision of an Indonesian state and culture. And the last four principles are ideas that are supposed to be shared by all ethnic groups. So the Pancasila was uh, opposed by many Islamists. However, the strong defendant of the Pancasila ideology has been the Indonesian military, which is dominated by moderate Muslims and non-Muslims. So the military as an institution also serves as a means to integrate Indonesian society. So if Pancasila was the only ideology used to unite the country in Indonesia before the fall of Suharto, since his departure, Rakyat or the Supreme Consultative Council has been eager to promote three other ideological pillars and these are the 1945 Constitution, the concept of the Indonesian Unitary State, and the principles of unity in diversity. Nation building or nation destroying? This is the question when Indonesian national unity encountered a crisis when East Timor left Indonesia to become an independent country. So in 1975, Indonesia invaded East Timor and annexed it the following year. So this created a major problem for Indonesia later as Jakarta was determined to integrate East Timor by force. So East Timorese rebels were temporarily defeated but the opposition to Indonesia never disappeared. So the harsh rule of the Indonesian military eventually gave rise to even more first resistance. So in conclusion, Modern Indonesia was a product of the Indonesian nationalist movement, which emerged in the 20th century under the Dutch colonial rule. So the movement eventually united the country's diverse ethnic groups and created the Indonesian nation-state. There were a few ethnic separatist movements which were quelled by the central government, but with the exception of Dadi East Timor, which became an independent state in 2002, but this was a special case. So the only remaining ethnic separatist movement of some scale is that in Papua, but it remains weak. Although secular ideology as reflected in Pancasela remains dominant, various Islamist ideologies have at times challenged the national ideology. 
This can be seen the various uh, political events before and the fall of Suharto. This may affect the continuing process of the nation building in Indonesia. Before I'm going to end my report, I'm going to share with you the words coming from Anderson that throughout history, leaders have introduced policies to foster national identity that would sustain an imagined political community in which citizens remain connected by shared history and values despite never meeting one another. That would be all. Thank you for listening. Nation building in Malaysia. So before we start, let us first have a little heads up on what nation building is. So nation building refers to the process of constructing national identity using the power of the state. So people from diverse origin, spoke different languages, uh, different historical background and culture, as well as religion, converge and become unified. So these are the focus of this topic. The first one is survey the complex nature of state building. So we are going to investigate how Malaysia as a country grew. Uh, the second one is discuss how Malaysia responded to its condition or how it deals with the issue of nation building. So we are going to see how Malaysians address their issue of nation building. So the third one is compare how Malaysia developed socio-cultural basis for national integration. So what kind of nation state is Malaysia? Malaysia has lacked clear-cut national identity. However, Malaysian Prime Minister Dr. Mahathi envisioned Bangsa Malaysia or this is what, what he envisioned that Malaysian people and non-Malay come into a modern, highly developed, egalitarian Malaysian nation. However, on September 29, 2001, he also declared Malaysia as an Islamic state, which is contradictory to what he believed in. And there were those critics that say Malaysia is already emerging as a multi-ethnic and multi-cultural nation. But it is far from a civil society that is democratic, just, and egalitarian. A political scientist by the name of Benedict Anderson dubbed Malaysia as an imagined community. Psychological needs answered by the sense of nationality, the personal and cultural feeling of belonging to or aspiring for a particular nation. So they will never meet or know fellow members yet they have a sense of unity and a shared goal. However, most Ma Malay nationalists aspire for a Malay nation state, but also there were non-Malay communities desired some kind of multicultural egalitarian Malaysian nation or Bangsa Malaysia. But there were also these religious people such as the past this wanted to uh, establish an ex Islamic state in Malaysia. So, since there were conflicting ideologies, a Chinese social organization urged Dr. Mahathir to make his vision a reality by removing the differences between Bumiputra or indigenous people and the non-Bumiputra. <clears throat> However, the ensuing debate showed that Malays generally were not yet willing to give up their special rights and privileges. Until then, it seems unlikely to have a Bangsa Malaysia uh, rule. So is Malaysia homogeneous or multi-ethnic? Cornelia Navari calls Malaysia a fictional entity. There were those nationalists in Malaysia attempting to create a quality of homogeneous people, wherein they share the same culture, the same language, and who are governed by some of their number, who share their interests. However, the challenge was that, for instance, a nationalist leader of dominant ethnic majority would try to integrate or assimilate other ethnic communities. It would create ethnic antagonism with most, most communities that wishes to be autonomous. 
So what had glued Malaysia together? Politically, since the independence, Malaysia has put in place a parliamentary democracy with a periodic elections, which led to the creation of UMNO. And UMNO wanted to protect the interests of Malays and non Malays. Moreover, there were certain policies that promote harmony between the Malays and non Malays. One example is a policy created by Mahathir Muhammad, which aims to create an inclusive identity for all inhabitants of Malaysia. So, this policy is what we call Bangsa Malaysia. The, there is also a governmental success that paid way in instilling nationalism in Malaysia. The four prime minister, namely Tukno Abdul Rahman, Abdul Razak Hussain, and Hussein On, and also Mahathir bin Muhammad, offered policy that further strengthened their nationalism. So, how did Malaysia become a nation? The Brits was the most influential colonizer of Malaysia. Their goal was to invent a civic and territorial state, Malaya, Sarawak, Borneo, uh, are the components in creating this civic state of there. During the Japanese occupation, it contributed to the growth of Malay nationalism by promoting the anti-colonial theme of Asians for Asians. After the war in 1946, British crafted the Malayan Union, which wanted to end Malay's special rights. The reason behind this is that the Brit, the Brit wanted to get the tin and rubber industries stabilized to help pay reconstruction of the damages during World War II. To ease racial tension, the creation of OMNO, MIC, MCA was there to help unify both Malays and non-Malays. In the implementation of nation building agenda, there were contradicting views between Malays and non Malays. So, non Malays preferred a minimalist and less government intrusive approach, whereas Malay nationalists opted for a strong state intervention. So, let us start with Malay. Malay nationalists argued that the past was the cause of their weak economic position, so they looked at the state to advance their status. And they believed that through education and sharing the common language, young generations of Malays would have an identical outlook on the nation. And they also wanted an Islamic state. On the other hand, the non-Malays voted on laissez-faire, which means the government is less involved in the economy. They also wanted separation of religion and state so public power would not be influenced by religious institution. And moreover, it would they, the laws would not be in par with religion and it would not be as biased. So the challenges are still prevalent in unifying Malaysia. So the challenges were the racial tension between this um, ethnic group such as the non-Malays and the Malays which wanted different uh, way of running the politics and different way of seeing culture so basically they still have a lot to go when it comes to unifying and the process of nation building Good day everyone my name is Renal General Guarte and today we are going to talk about nation building in Singapore in this topic we're going to tackle about how Singapore has been built and has been founded. So first, let us talk about forging Malaysia and Singapore, colonialism, decolonization, and nation building. Nations have been compared with organisms, metaphors of growth and evolution, of life and death, have been used in their depiction. They have alternatively been seen as constructs or products of a political process characterized as nation building. This process is sometimes described as forging a nation. It suggests feats of engineering and conjures up the heat of the workshop and the strength and skill of the craftsman. 
Yet, fabrication also suggests falsification. And indeed, as Avi Schleim has commented, it is interesting to note how frequently the phrase forging a nation is used because most nations are forgeries. Indeed, some nations are based on little more than a mythological view of the past and of hatred of foreigners. And it has been known that the colonial period helps in the foundation of the states. For it, demarcated territorial boundaries, established institutions of centralized government, developed primate cities, served as a conduit for global influences, and vacated models for modernization. Colonialism was also responsible for the integration of communities within larger government, structures, and economic systems, contributed to individuals' consciousness of being members of a larger community, and colonial state not only provo provoked demands for self-determination, but also provided the mold for its successor, the nation, the, the nation state rather. Though colonialism has given some improvements, it also gave some structural flaws like inequalities between communities or regions and challenging indigenous cultural assumptions, differences within society and between peoples to spawn a variety of competing nationalisms that would later threaten the integrity and jeopardize the stability of nation states. So to furthermore understand how colonization helped in molding Singapore, let us go back to its history. So the history of Singapore. So Singapore was once been captured by the Portuguese and destroyed its foundation from its past sultanates. But during the Napoleonic Wars, the British were able to challenge the Dutch for supremacy in the region under the influence of Stamford Raffles. He was a British statesman, lieutenant governor of the Dutch East Indies during 1811 to 1816, and lieutenant governor of Ben Kulen during 1818 to 1824, and is best known for his founding of modern Singapore and the Straits Settlements. He joined the East India Company at the age of 14, and by the age of 24, he learned local languages in and around Malaya, and was promoted to governor of Java at the age of 30. He then established the trading post import of Singapore in 1890, and entered into a contract with the Sultan of Johor, leading to the establishment of the British Crown Colony in Singapore during 1890. A formal treaty was signed on February 6, 1819, and modern Singapore was born. After that, after those years, um, the status of a British outpost in Singapore seemed initially in doubt, as the Dutch government soon protested to Britain for violating the Netherlands' sphere of influence. But as Singapore rapidly emerged as an important trading post, Britain consolidated its claim on the island. So that's when the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824 cemented the status of Singapore as a British possession, carving up the Malay archipelago between the two colonial powers with the area north of the Straits of Malacca, including Singapore, falling under Britain's sphere of influence. So in 1826, Singapore was grouped by the British East India Company together with Penang and Malacca to form the Straits Settlements administered by the British East India Company. In 1830, the Strait Settlement became a residency or subdivision of the Presidency of Bengal in British India. So after that, after the Strait Settlements happened, as Singapore continued to grow, the deficiencies in the Strait Settlements administration caused by overpopulation and public health care problems became serious and Singapore's merchant community began agitating against British Indian rule. So the British government agreed to establish the Strait Settlements as a separate Crown Colony on April 1, 1867. This new colony was ruled by a governor under the supervision of the Colonial Office in London. An executive council and a legislative council assisted the governor. Although members of councils were not elected, more representatives for the local population were gradually included over the years. And the city itself received a facelift. Public buildings were constructed, modernized police force, and institutions were established that brought an end to some serious social problems. 
So it was not long until the Japanese arrived and the World War II happened. During World War II, the British colony surrendered the Allied forces in Singapore to the Imperial Japanese Army due to shattered defenses and exhaustion of supplies. That would lead to Singaporeans losing their trust to the British colony. Singapore was renamed into Shonan, that means the Light of the South. It was occupied for three and a half years from 1942 up to 1945. But after that, after the war happened, British troops returned to Singapore to receive the formal surrender of the Japanese forces in the region on September 12, 1945. And the British military administration was formed to govern the island until March 1946. However, the failure of Britain to defend Singapore had destroyed its credibility as an infallible ruler in the eyes of Singaporeans. The decades after the war saw a political awakening amongst local populace and the rise of anti-colonial and nationalist sentiments epitomized by the slogan Merdeka or independence in the Malay language. The British, on their part, were prepared to gradually increase self-governance for Singapore and Malaya. So on April 1, 1946, the Strait Settlements was dissolved and Singapore became a separate crown colony with a civil administration headed by a governor that led to the foundation of the first legislative council in 1948 up to 1951 and the second legislative council in 1951 up to 1955. After the first and second legislative councils has been founded, David Marshall, the leader of the Labour Front, became the first Chief Minister of Singapore. He presided over a shaky government, receiving a little cooperation from both the colonial government of British and other local parties. Social unrest in his time was on rise and seriously discredited Marshall's government. In April 1956, Marshall led a delegation to London to negotiate for a complete self-rule or self-government in the Merdeka talks. But the talks failed when the British were reluctant to give up control over Singapore's internal security. The British were concerned about communist influence since a majority of the population of Singapore during that time was Chinese and they feared that the, the communist influence over the Chinese has come upon to Singapore and labor strikes which were undermining Singapore's economic stability and felt that the local government was ineffective in handling earlier riots. Marshall resigned following the failure of the talk. After that, the new chief minister, Lim Yu Hock, launched a crackdown on communist and leftist groups, imprisoning many trade union leaders and several pro-communist members under the Internal Security Act. So after that, the British government approved Lim's tough stance against communist agitators. And when a new round of talks was held beginning in March 1957, they agreed to grant the complete internal self-government of Singapore. After that, the state of Singapore would be created with its own citizenship. As a result, in 1959, Singapore became an independent country within the British Empire electing Lee Kuan Yew as the nation's first Prime Minister. So during the first years of Lee Kuan Yew as Prime Minister, um, despite and despite their successes in governing Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew together with the Deputy Prime Minister Bo Keng Sui believed that Singapore's future lay with the Malaya. They felt that the historic and economic ties between Singapore and Malaya were too strong for them to continue as a separate nations. So furthermore, Singapore lacked natural resources and faced both a declining entrepreneurial trade and a growing population that required jobs. So it was thought that the merger between the two nations would benefit the economy by creating common market, eliminating trade tariffs, and thus supporting a new industries which would solve the ongoing unemployment woes. And indeed, September 16, 1963, Malaya, Singapore, North Borneo, and Sarawak were merged and Malaysia was formed. But that did not took long enough because of racial tensions because Singapore was composed of 77% Chinese, 14.8% Malays, 
um, 7% Indians and other race. Racial tensions increased as ethnic Chinese and other non-Malay ethnic groups in Singapore rejected the discriminatory policies imposed by the Malays, such as quotas and special privileges were granted to the Malays guaranteed under Article 153 of the Constitution of Malaysia. There were also other financial and economic benefits that were preferentially given to Malays. That's why Lee Kuan Yew and other political leaders began advocating for the fair and equal treatment of all races in Malaysia, with a rallying cry of Malaysian, Malaysia. Numerous racial riots resulted, and curfews were frequently imposed to restore order. The most notorious riots were the 1964 race riots that first took place on Prophet Muhammad's birthday on July 21, with 23 people killed and hundreds injured. During the unrest, the price of the food skyrocketed when the transport system was disrupted, causing further hardship for the people. And to add, the state and federal governments also had conflicts with the economic front. UMNO, or United Malays National Organization leaders, feared that the economic dominance of Singapore would inevitably shift political power away from Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital. That's why, seeing no alternative to avoid further bloodshed and conflict, the Malaysian Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman decided to expel Singapore from the Federation. And that's why on August 9, 1965, the Parliament of Malaysia voted 126-0 in favor of a constitutional amendment expelling Singapore from the Federation. After that, the new state became the Republic of Singapore with Yusuf bin Ishak appointed as its first president. Not long after it became Republic of Singapore and after gaining independence abruptly, Singapore faced future filled with uncertainties. The confrontasi or the confrontation between UMNO and Singapore's leaders was ongoing and the conservative UMNO faction strongly opposed the separation. Singapore faced the dangers of attack by the Indonesian military and forcible reintegration into Malaysia Federation on unfavorable terms. So there's a high chance that Singapore will come back or will merge again with Malaysia. Much of the international media was also skeptical of prospects for Singapore's survival. Besides the issue of sovereignty, the pressing problems were in unemployment, um, housing, education, and the lack of natural resources and land since they are just an island. Unemployment was ranging between 10 to 12 percent, threatening to trigger civil unrest and threatening to oust um, Lee Kuan Yew as the Prime Minister. So after that, Singapore immediately sought international recognition of its sovereignty. So the new state joined the United Nations on September 21, 1965 becoming the 117th member and also joined the Commonwealth in October that year. And not much after that, Singapore later co-founded the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN on August 8, 1967. After they have gained uh, their independence, they have to cope up with whatever is lacking within them. So. The Economic Development Board had been set up in 1961 to formulate and implement national economic strategies focusing on promoting Singapore's manufacturing sector. Industrial states were set up and foreign investment was instructed to the country with tax incentives, of course. The industrialization transformed the manufacturing sector to one that produced higher value added goods and achieved greater revenue. Also, service industry also grew at this time, driven by demand for services by ships calling at the port and increasing commerce. This progress helped to elevate the unemployment crisis. Adding to that, Singapore also attracted big oil companies like Shell and Esso to establish oil refineries in Singapore, which by mid-1970s became the third largest oil refining center in the world. The government invested heavily 
in an educational system that adopted English as the language of instruction and emphasized um, practical learning to develop a competent workforce well suited for the industry. Also, the lack of good public housing, poor sanitation, and high unemployment led to social problems from crime to health issues. That's why the Housing Development Board set up before independence continued to be largely successful and huge building projects sprung up to provide affordable public housing to resettle the squatters. Within a decade, the majority of the population had been housed in these apartments. Adding to that, the Central Provident Fund or CPF housing scheme introduced in 1968. It allows residents to use their compulsory savings account to purchase HDB flats or those apartments and gradually increases home ownership in Singapore. British troops had remained in Singapore following its independence, but in 1968, London announced its decision to withdraw the forces by 1971. With the secret aid of military advisors from Israel, Singapore rapidly established the Singapore Armed Forces with the help of a national service program introduced in 1967. Since independence, Singaporean defense has been spending approximately um, 5% of the gross domestic products. Today, the Singapore Armed Forces are among the best equipped in Asia. During 1980s and 1990s, further economic success continued through um, those years with an employment rate failing to 3% and the real GDP growth averaging at about 8% up until 1999. During the 1980s, Singapore began to um, upgrade to higher technological industries such as wafer fabrication sector in order to compete with its neighbors which now had cheaper labor. Singapore Changi Airport was opened in 1981 and Singapore Airlines was developed to become a major airline. The port of Singapore became one of the world's busiest ports and the service of and tourism Industries also grew immensely during this period. Singapore emerged as an important transportation hub and a major tourist destination. The Housing Development Board or HDB continued to promote public housing with new towns such as Ang Mo Kyo is being designed and built. These new residential states have larger and higher standard apartments and are served with better amenities. Today, 80 to 90 percent of the population lives in HDB apartments. In 1987, the first mass rapid transit or MRT line began operation, connecting most of these housing states and the city center. By the success of Lee Kuan Yew coping up with the independence, he resigned out of office on November 28, 1990, and was replaced by Go Jok Tong and became the second Prime Minister of Singapore. He was in office on November 28, 1990 up to August 12, 2004. After his term, he was then followed by Lee Kuan Yew's son, which is Lee Hsien Long, which took office on August 12, 2004 up to the present. At this point, the narrative moves on. Since August 1965, nation building in Singapore has differed from the process in many um, other post-colonial states. Uh, it has not depended on a methodological view of its origins and a hatred of foreigners. On the contrary, being a society of immigrants and unencumbered by a pre-colonial history, um, Singapore has neither raked over the past nor turned on, on itself. Rather, it has pursued modern goals and has planned for a future in which the city-state will remain indispensable to the region. Nation building here has also differed from the experience elsewhere in Southeast Asia, largely because of features that distinguished the island from its neighbors, such as its size, its location, um, its commercial traditions, and Chinese majority. As a result of separation from Malaysia, the state of Singapore resumed its precise close-knit geographical definition, which is to be a, an industrial um, country unique amongst um, 
Southeast Asian countries in having an overwhelmingly Chinese majority. Um, Singapore has greater ethnic homogeneity than all the others. Its compactness gave full scope to the dynamic leadership of Lee Kuan Yew and to the central planning and managerial control that have been crucial to the effectiveness of nation-building policies, notably in the areas of urban planning, um, housing, education, transport, and other public services. Despite its size, um, the city-state has also benefited from a global reach since being commercial rather than agrarian. It has taken maximum advantage of its geopolitical position to develop as a trading, financial, and communications center. Singapore has had to leapfrog the rest of the region and attract multinational companies. Although, um, in this Leviathan, political liberty has been surrendered in return for um, public services. Yet, coexisting with the nanny state is a strong culture of self-reliance, educational opportunity, and economic liberalism. Locked together, state and the individual have cemented social solidarity, while planning and prosperity have endangered a national self-confidence. However, siding with self-confidence stalks fear. Um, fear of attack, fear of failure, uh, fear of forgetting the rugged society's struggle to succeed. Fear, too, has um, reinforced national solidarity for a pervading sense of vulnerability has led not only to an obsession with defense and internal um, security, but also to an ethos of social conformity and individual's dedication to the common good and collective will. Not surprisingly, history has a little appeal to this forward-looking society, but it has not uh, been entirely dismissed as bunk. But the story of People's Action Party or Riding the Tiger of Communism is regularly retold. So too are successes and failures of the colonial period during the British times, um, notably the triumph of Raffles in 1819 and the surrender of Percival in 1942. Furthermore, as Singapore rose from the ashes of the Malaysia experiment, its leaders, headed by Lee Kuan Yew, consciously forged the nation-state on the anvil of the colonial legacy. So indeed, they have used whatever colonial influence uh, they gathered from the British colony and used it to furthermore enforce a much stronger nation-state. And when Margaret Thatcher marveled at Singapore's progress since 1965, Lee Kuan Yew is supposed to have responded, we have applied the lessons which the British first taught us and then themselves promptly forgot. And indeed, the influence of the colonial period has really molded Singapore to become one of the most progressing countries, to become a growing country, and to become one of the most successful countries in the world. That's all for the nation building of Singapore and I hope you have learned something from it. Thank you and good day. Good day everyone, join me as we discover how Brunei Jerusalem built its nation. So I am your presenter, Jeremy A. Ligaspi. As you can see, this is the map of the modern Brunei Jerusalem. They have this kind of quite confusing territory because their territory is divided into two different enclaves. But before Brunei Jerusalem came to that kind of scenario, they have a long, long history of reasons yeah, why they come up with that kind of confusing territory. But before we start the presentation, I will start it with the quote made by the Sultan current, I mean the current Sultan of Brunei Jerusalem, Hassan Abulkia. So he said in his quote, Future peace, prosperity, and confidence depend not just on ourselves, but on the success of all nations. Hence, we are all partners no matter what our backgrounds, cultures, faith, and histories. 
So this is the history of Brunei. So we all know that Brunei was situated in the island of Borneo. The little territory there is the Brunei. But do you know that before Brunei, I mean Borneo was divided into four political regions, it was once owned by a single empire. I mean almost of the part of Borneo was once owned by an empire which we call the Bruneian Empire. When I say mo almost all of the of the island of Borneo, I mean I mean that it's it is just about ninety percent of the land was owned by that empire because the Bruneian Empire was into the Talasukasi um, power which the power is into the marine time wheel and it is not just the almost part of the Borneo was once owned by the Brunei Empire actually Palawan and some part of Luzon here in the Philippines was once part of the Brunei Empire and I will ex explain in the latter part why Brun I mean Palawan and some part of Luzon was no longer part of the Brunei so you must also know that the name of the island Borneo was from was derived from Biruni and Puni which means Brunei by a Portuguese navigator in the 15th century so basically Borneo is, was from was crafted from the name from the name of the country Brunei and before Brunei Empire almost dominated the whole island there were, there were already empire who gone into that island including of those island is a Srivijaya island one of the greatest 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 empire of the history of Southeast Asia where the influence of people living there the religion of Hinduism and it was so also believed that Song and Tang dynasty um, also gone into that island and they influence Buddhism but all of those religion was vanished because the king of Brunei, the emperor of that time in that island, converted himself into Islam because at, at that time, Islam comes into popularity that really wounded them. That That's why they neglected all of those influences that was given by those um, previous empire was was gone because of the popularity of Islam Islam really wounded that so yeah again Brunei king convert to Islam and installed as Islamic Sultan during the spreading of Islam religion throughout Southeast Asia at the 14th century that made the whole Borneo island are ruled by Islamic Brunei kingdom during 14th and 15th century so that made the whole island of Borneo an Islamic now so that's the reason why we can in in this time that's the reason why people living in Borneo are Islams or Muslim so who knows if the Brunei king didn't convert himself to Islam maybe the island have this kind of Buddhism and Hinduism religion but that's all part of the history now so let's move on so I already discussed the glimpse history of Brunei so we have this question how Brunei came into a, as a nation as one nation so before going that part let us know the beginnings so I had discussed in the la in the previous slide that Brunei was once an empire an empire was challenged by a crisis and it's not new to an emperor to have a crisis despite of the richness or bountifulness but they will that um, time will really time will really come that they will experience crisis like just what happened to the Roman Empire so the crisis that happened in the Brunei is what we call the Brunei Civil War and do you know that the Brunei Civil War just happened because of the cock fight yeah, you heard me right. Be just because of the cockfighting. The one that your Lolo, your uncle, or your father plays. Yeah, literally, the sabo. Was once the reason why 
Brunei Civil War happened. So this is the story. The son of the Sultan and the and the son of the prince uh, the the his cousin gone into a cockfighting and the son of the sultan was uh, lost the game to his cousin which happened to be the the son of the prince sibling of his father so his cousin mocked him yeah yeah you're a loser a loser like that so this the son of the sultan was so mad so because of madness he killed his cousin and after that he flew and i don't know where he goes but after no after after the what happened the prince the prince the sibling of his father heard the news and he was so mad and he want to kill his nephew but he can't find his nephew so his anger transferred to the prince sultan which happened to be his brother and killed his brother and after that he established himself as the new emperor of the brunei so to avoid the revolution of the supporters of the deceased sultan he made the grandchild of the of the deceased sultan to be one of the officials but in the latter years the the supporters of the DC Sultan persuade the grandson of the DC Sultan to revolt against the king against the current Sultan because they said they he has the right to be the next Sultan because he is the grandson of the DC Sultan at first the the grandchild was so what do you call this hesitant to do that but after that they realized that yes i am i have the right to be the next sultan because my father i mean my grandfather is the is the sultan yeah so they revolted and and here comes the sultanate of sulu who helped in the brunei civil war and because of the help they won and then as a gift, Brunei gave East of Sabah to the Sultan of Sulu. So now the East of Sulu was already part of this. I mean, the the East of Sabah was already part of Sulu. So that's why the family of Sultan now was um, fighting against the land, the East of Sabah, because they believed that they owned that. Because the um, in a history, Brunei gave that to them as a reward, but. We will not dwell into that. So yeah, Brunei Civil War happened. Brunei gave the East of Sabah. And now here comes the conquerors from the Western. So here comes the British East India Company. They go to the northern of Borneo. And the king of Brunei uh, sided, sided the, the land of Sarawak. So Sarawak now was owned by the by the British, you know. So, the territory of the Brunei was nakulangan na because they gave the Isaba and then they now they give the Sarawak. So the Sarawak, um, Sarawak was already owned by British and they, um, ilan ng gikon as a new Raj, the first white Raj, in the name of Sir James Brooke. So he is the first white Raj in the Sarawak. So because of that happenings. The decline of Brunei Empire happened because their territories was already um, you no know, divided into different prisons. So the Sarawak was into the British East, um, to the British, and then the East of Sabah was already given to the Sultanate of Sulu, and then the the territory in the Philippines was already colonized by the Spaniards. So yeah, little by little the. Dec the decline of Brunei Empire happened. So to avoid the further declination, I mean, yeah, they come into a decision to become what a part of British protectorate. So Brunei asked for help to avoid the further decline. So they were already now a under the British protectorate. So 
after being a British protectorate during the in the latter part of 1960s, the British the Britain um, government gave this some power to the Sultan Sultan of Brunei to govern itself, but still under the pressure of the British. Yeah. So another decision that Nana Grisa. Brunei Sultan is to be to union with other countries. So Brunei would align itself to Singapore, Sabah, Sarawak, and Malaya, and for Malaysia. But they changed. But the Sultan's mind was changed because the Sultan is not yet ready to share his wealth to other countries and also to secure his power to his land. So yeah, he declined those offers. So after those. In 1971, under agreement with the UK, Brunei ceased to be a British protected state. The constitution was amended to give the Sultan full control over all internal matters. The UK retaining responsibility for defense and foreign affairs. Brunei became a fully independent sovereign state on January 1, 1984. So after they received their full independence from the Britain, here comes the battle of national identity. In the night during 1960s, um, the, there is a rising of rebellion against the monarchy, but it was too small to grow, and directly it was um, seized by the government with the help of the British government, of course. And although the the Brunei now was under the Islamic control because their leader is an Islam, and majority of the people living there are Islam, there's still a minority. Who are Christians, Buddhists, and Hindu, and that's why it is so controversial that Sharia law was um, in was implemented in the in the Brunei, and one of the controversial part of the Sharia law is the is about the LGBTQ um, pro prohibition. Like if you are caught that you are part of LGBTQ um, community will be punished to death like even though you're not a Muslim or you're or Muslim you are because we all know that Sharia law is all, it's just for Muslims but even in Brunei even though you're not a Muslim if you are um, engaged into that kind of um, um, relationship like same-sex relationship you will be punished and yeah it's so sad because they have that kind of um, um, law which prohibit to show who you are that's why the people of um, Brunei are really what you call this not that they don't experience really a what we call democracy despite of they already um, 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 receive the independence from the British and but what amazes me the most is that despite of those laws that was implemented in their country there's they still live as one they are not they are not divided and they they become as one nation because of their um, leader Asana Bolkia he is so admirable because he he made his state to be a a one nation despite of what religion that you have and and that's the cause why there's no revolutionary the revolutions that happen in their in their island right now although because of the so much um, I mean tight tight power of the of the Sultan because Sultan is one of the last absolute leader in the one of the absolute leader in the world because he's not just a prime minister but he is also a sultan yeah so maybe the people living there um are are not revolting to each other because of the promise that they will not pay taxes so that's the consequence the sultan um, promised them not to pay taxes but just to obey obey the law and for them law is law that's why that's why they really um, peaceful country because they believe that 
they live as one they have this one they live as one they have the same culture although different um, religion but this is just a minority that's why that made them a one nation so that's all thank you sum it all up there has been a lot that contributes to the nation building process of the said countries majority of it boils down to its roots and its history and if you look closely foreign influence may have contributed to the process to some or majority of the countries involved some may be under colonial experience like philippines singapore malaysia brunei and indonesia or citizens may have some foreign ethnicity themselves like thailand Though this foreign influence may have contributed a lot in the nation building process, it also gave some negative impact that also delays the process itself like the division of social opinions and the domination of these alien norms and practices that disregarded the origins and history of a country. While in the process of building their nation, problems may have surfaced like cultural and religion diversity, multi-ethnicity, social problems, and the abuse of powers of the leaders themselves. But what's more important is how they cope up and made proper solutions to address these problems, like establishing national symbols, language and religion that represents the people, um, strengthening their economy, fixing their constitution, and by codifying laws that benefits their people. By identifying history, influences, problems, and their solutions, you can see how the process of nation building has been effective and it can be seen today as Southeast Asian countries has been continuously progressing over the years. Some countries may have not the most pleasant history that there is but it helped them strengthen their nation and face the challenges of independence. That is all for the entirety of this topic, the nation building in Southeast Asian countries. Thank you and stay safe.